Welcome to Here She Stands, the podcast where Lutheran women from across Australia come together as a community, sharing stories and testifying to God's goodness. We do this so when the tribulations of this world try to push us down, each woman can hold firm to the word of God and confidently say, here I stand, I can do no other. My name is Lexi and I am a homeschooling mama of four girls and the wife of a first year pastoral student. I love theology books, classical music, and I'm currently trying my hand at becoming more self-sufficient. And I'm Sonia, a Lutheran pastor's wife, homeschooling mum of two kiddos, homemaker, tradition lover, and all-round crafty person. On today's episode, we're going to be talking with Sarah Joy Fandrick. Sarah Joy lives in Barambadok, New South Wales, and is married to Christian who is a Lutheran pastor and also a GP. Together they have seven children, whom they also homeschool. During a recent conversation I had with Sarah Joy, she made a critique of the intro pro music that we use for our podcast. And the gist of it was, you need to use Bach. Isn't that right, Sarah? <laughs> yes. Bach is the best. So welcome to um, our podcast and thank you for taking the time to join us and to share your story. Thank you for having me. So to start off with, we would just love to know a bit more about you. Yeah, just tell us a little bit about how you and your husband met and how long you've been married. So Christian and I met at what was then Luther Seminary. I had come to the seminary in 2001 to live and also to study for a year to upgrade my teaching degree. And I'd worked out a way that I could study theology full time to do that. And Christian was studying at Luther Seminary, or it's now Australian Lutheran College, as a private student, whilst he was also practicing as a general practitioner. And we took Aboriginal issues together with Paul Albrecht. He reckons he noticed me as soon as I arrived. I remember noticing him, but the fact that he was a doctor actually made me disinterested, which really that's a bit odd, but <laughs> I'm prejudiced. <laughs> Anyway, sometime in September of that year, I asked him for some medical advice, which he happily gave. And then he said I owed him 50 bucks for the for the consult. And I didn't yep. think that he was joking, but I offered to take him out for coffee sometime. And when he said he'd take a rain check, I thought I was off the hook. But a week later, he called me up and suggested coffee. It ended up being yep. dinner, which I didn't have the money for. So <laughs> he paid for it but the conversation was really hard work he was he's a quiet thinking man and I think he used up an awful lot of his courage asking me out and struggled to keep up his end of the conversation he's not big with small talk but the next day he took me to the airport and I, I was going on holidays back to my parents in Melbourne I was feeling a bit funny in the tummy and he stayed with me even though the plane was two and a half hours late and I was like oh my goodness I have to listen to this guy we have to try and keep <laughs> conversation with him uh, yeah. but he was more com talkative but the comment that remained with me was he said I'm nearly 30 and I've done nothing with my life but what I really heard when he said that was he really wanted a wife and he was <laughs> looking straight at me and I was <laughs> yeah horrified so uh, what followed was three dates which were each followed by me telling him that it would never happen and yep. that he wasn't a kindred spirit he wasn't for me it wouldn't work uh, and Christian uh, was being advised by one of his doctor colleagues to just try one more time but in the meantime I had this revelation that he was actually like Mr Darcy yes. and if anyone knows the BBC version of Pride and Prejudice I was a lost cause once I said that to myself so we yep. were engaged within a week and a half of that, married five months later, and uh, somehow we managed to surprise even the gossip mongers at Luther Seminary because there was an audible gasp when Dr. Peter Lockwood announced our engagement, and it was quite fun. So we've been married for 20 years. Wow. Yes. That's a great story. Sarah, Joy, <laughs> that honestly sounds like a novel or some type of romance movie. Your story. Uh, I'd love that to could write be one. made into a movie. I'd love to write one. It feels amazing in my mind. Anyways, yes. still love him. He's still amazing. So now that you've got seven children, yeah, and just with some of the literature references that you made there, um, you're definitely a homeschooling mama. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about your children. What are their interests or occupations? Our eldest is Enoch and he's nearly 20 and he's studying medicine at Charles Sturt University in Orange and loving that. Our next is Abigail. She's 18. She's 
studied fashion de- design and technology and she's currently studying a certificate of performance in piano and she's also studying at uni in preparation for a bachelor of occupational therapy my goodness and then I'm homeschooling yes yeah, she's busy then I'm homeschooling Andreas who's 16 Thomas who's 14 Sophia who's 12 Noah who's nine and Bethany who's nearly seven okay so your hands are still very much full <laughs> yes very much yes so. Okay, so with the literature references that you made before, I I got Anna Green Gables and, of course, uh, Pride and Prejudice. You're obviously a classical education, and I know we've talked about it before, Charlotte Mason homeschooling mama. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about that and how that works for your family. Yes, so Charlotte Mason was around in the time when classical education was the thing. She specifically spoke to parents who were teaching their children at home in England, but also she had schools that she was helping teachers teach. And her approach to education is primarily through the use of great books, Mm -hmm. not dumbing down education. She particularly wants to speak to children as whole persons rather than belittling them in the way that you lower the, the you lower the tone of how you speak to a child so she's specifically wanting to speak to children i suppose like little adults but as people that can actually understand yes and bringing their understanding up to an adult's understanding rather than talking down to a child she also is very keen on reading living books to children which is it's about reading books that are not twaddle <laughs> that's yeah. her word she talks about twaddle so books that speak what is true good and beautiful yeah Charlotte Mason was very much into treating the whole of the child so there's no separation between morals and academics and everyday living and reading it's all yeah. it all seems to be sort yeah. of wrapped up together that your morals and everything should be in everything that you read and do and learn and that all of those things are connected and um, not separate. And so when you're reading a book, all of those things should be together. That's right. As you make those connections and those relationships in your mind, it creates a whole person. And I appreciate how she has gone about doing that through reading living books to children, reading whole books to children, not cutting and pasting and choosing the bits that sort of work and other bits leaving out. So what type of books are you reading to your children at the moment? So at the moment, I've just finished reading a little book, a very little, cute little book called 20 and 10, which Mm -hmm. is about World War II and some French children living in an orphanage, I think, or a school. And they are asked to take on 10 Jewish children and how these children then have to hide the 10 Jewish children because the Nazis come and their teacher is away at the time and they have to hide it and somehow protect these Jewish children. It's a very beautiful, short, short little story. It's only five chapters long, but that's been our introduction for my children into World War II, which we yeah. start thoroughly investigating next week in our school yeah. time together. So we've just, yeah. that was reading ahead a little bit. We've been talking this week about the Great Depression, which is totally interesting when you consider where we are sitting in time at the moment with mm-hmm. the great struggles of inflation and the rising cost of living, which everyone's talking about. So yeah. putting all that together and helping my children see how history has keeps coming back on itself mm. and yes. how we can do things differently for our own family. Yes, and one, one thing that I really like is introducing children to, you could say, the intense parts of life. And this is what Charlotte Mason was very much about it's it's not modly coddling them and just giving them the dumb stuff the, yeah. the just the the simple stuff but introducing you know the difficulties of world war ii to children in the form of literature and i love the idea of this is what i try to do with my girls is when you introduce a child to something more intense it's really good to bring a hero into it so when i introduced my girls to world war ii it was through corrie ten boom reading her story oh so Um, beautiful and and yeah yes in that story is a beacon of light to me just constantly 
thanking God for even the fleas. And I'm mm, like, yes. Lord, I need to thank you for the fleas in my life. Yes. Hard to do that. But in the end, God shows Betsy and Corey why the fleas yep. were important. It protected, it protected them. them. Yes. It allowed them to have their own special Bible study time together with the ladies. Yeah. Oh, so brilliant. I'm really keen to actually get the title and author off of that book again because that sounds like a really interesting story. Um, we'll. But yeah. You'll have to put it in yes. the show notes. Yes, I'll put it in the show notes. Yes. Do you have any good books that you recommend on learning about? Charlotte Mason homeschooling? Actually, I would suggest initially going to the Simply Charlotte Mason website. Mm -hmm. Mm. That particular website, I continually go back to myself. She has a lot of simple, straightforward ways on how to implement Charlotte Mason into your daily life. She also has a podcast, Sonia Schaefer. I think it was her mother who wrote a book about it. Or maybe it was Sonia who wrote the book. I can't remember. But there are other books. I have appreciated Educating the Whole Hearted Child by Clay and Sally Clarkson and The Well-Trained Mind by Susan Weisbauer. They've both been helpful for me in how I have looked at education. But also as I've read through those two books, my mind has, this was already how I was wanting to do it. This was this already seemed the right way to do it. So I was already there. It was like an explanation of what I'm already doing, which mm-hmm. is really always encouraging to see. Yeah. And Sonia, if you wanted to get in real deep, just go straight to Charlotte Mason's six volume. Is it six volume? Yeah, Set she's got six volumes. Up. Okay. Most of which yes. I think you can find those online because they would be out of print now. Yes. Although you can There have been some groups that have put them together and had them reprinted and reprinted in more modern English as well. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Heading back over to being a mum of a big family and homeschooling, how do you stay attentive to the individual needs and interests of your children, especially through homeschooling? Well, this is why I really love Charlotte Mason's approach to education and I implement it in how I teach my children because it allows for the individual differences, but it also allows for the creation of a beautiful group dynamic. Initially with homeschooling, it's always one to one on one because you need to teach your child to read. And this has always been the most important thing in my homeschool. As a side note, which you've already noticed, our family are bookophiles. So <laughs> we have a proper library in our home that's floor to high ceiling in books. Mm-hmm. And that's really important in our everyday life. So teaching kids how to read and primarily we teach them how to read so that they can read God's word as well. And so sitting down together so that we can read God's word together as a family each night has been a part of helping them to learn what's true, good and beautiful and important in our family. But homeschooling for me is growing community together as a family as we share our books together and we share adventures together and develop our family culture. So I have a number of different kids in my family. Every kid is unique in their own way and in amongst the uniqueness in my family We have a number of children who are neurodivergent. This Mm -hmm. means they have letters behind their name that adds to their uniqueness, such as ADHD, otherwise known as attention deficit disorder, or better described as VAST, variable attention stimulus trait, or ASD, autism spectrum disorder, better known as Asperger's syndrome, or OCD, better known as obsessive compulsive disorder or dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, otherwise known as specific learning disorder in reading, writing and maths, respectively. And all that's quite a mouthful. So managing those differences in my home has been helpful using Charlotte Mason's approach of reading aloud together. Yeah. Because some of my kids have really struggled to learn in their reading and it's it hasn't been as obvious for them that they're that different because we've been learning together. So we start our day together sitting down with Bible memory yeah. and we use the Simply Charlotte Mason Bible memory process. Go and look it up on her website. It's absolutely fantastic. And memorize Bible verses together and then We'll pray together using the Barnabas prayer calendar, which is a sneaky way of getting in geography because I think today we're praying for somewhere specifically that's in Southeast Asia. They wouldn't tell us the name of the place. I was thinking it was probably Myanmar or Burma, 
but you can then go and look at that on the map, which we often do. And then after praying for that place and our family, we'll then sing a hymn together because all that memory work is just really helpful for the children in developing their language. Mm -hmm. But for me, as a Christian mama, I'm wanting to hide God's word in their heart. And you can't do that unless you can remember it. So consistently putting new Bible verses there for God to work with later in life I don't know what's going to happen in the future I don't know if we're going to come to a time where the written word God's word will be taken away from us yeah I don't know what the future will bring whether my kids will end up as drunks on the side of the road or whatever I remember a story in my youth of a man who came to Christ he was drunk and on the side of the road in the gutter and he remembered a bible verse and that's how he came to God and I'm like wow you remembered a Bible verse from Sunday school, you know, when you had mm-hmm. to memorize Bible verses in Sunday school. I thought, wow, that's important. Memorizing God's word is so important. So I stick that right up the front because that's really important to us as a family. And then memorizing hymns because for me, I don't know what it's like for, for anybody else, but I get hymns stuck in my head and I'll start seeing the liturgy or a hymn or a line from a hymn and it just sort of earworms in my head and goes round and round. And I fully believe that that is God speaking to me through the the words of those hymns. So what what a way to get that into their heads and to to use song to allow God to speak to our children and to keep God's word singing through their mind. So that's how we start. And then we move on to history and read history together or science together. And then they'll do their individual subjects such as maths or reading and writing. A little bit more individualistic as the day goes on. I would love to ask you more questions about raising and homeschooling children that have letters at the end of their name because we've mentioned this before um, in our conversation before a couple of weeks ago that I also have ma- uh, letters at the end of my name and I'm pretty sure some of my children do too. How do you manage that? You've said that Charlotte Mason is such a beautiful, good way of educating neurodiverse children. Mm. But I know, I know that there's also more challenges as well. Homeschooling is parenting on steroids. It's all the good stuff and all the hard stuff and it's magnified. So it is hard work. I started homeschooling because even as a trained teacher, I knew that this is the best way that I could give my children an education for their abilities. If the child has exceptionalities, then homeschooling is the best way for them to be able to succeed. If the child has difficulties, then homeschooling is also the best way for them to be able to succeed. However, it's hard work with all the differences. I've only looked into those differences in the last three years and I encourage other parents to notice how you're managing with your children in the different tasks that you give them. I I knew very early on that I had a variety of uniquenesses with my kids and I knew the ones that wouldn't cope at school because of their anxieties or their ability to manage their behaviour or because they needed to be a year or two ahead of the rest of their age group. And initially I didn't get any testing done because I didn't want to put them in a box. However, in getting a number of my kids a diagnosis in the past three years, I've realised how very isolating it was for me to be the only one in their life who was able to help them manage when they were struggling. So Mm -hmm. I think starting down the road of getting a diagnosis has been very helpful and has allowed for me to get some more support. I've found one of the things that helps my kids the most is allowing them to have their differences. In the past, I think even back in Charlotte Mason's time, a child would have an interest in a specific area and they would be allowed to master that and move in that direction rather than be boxed into, well, I know you like woodwork, but you're going to have to do all this other stuff before you can get to going back to your woodwork. Or I know you like drawing, but you're going to have to master all these other things and give up your drawing for this time so that you can master these other things. And I have realized I need to encourage those things that they're good at because kids with neurodivergence, (laughs) I hate that word, kids with difficulties in these areas, they have difficulties all the time. Everything's hard. And if we take away the one thing that they're good at or the couple of things that we're good at, 
just so that we can get them to focus on the reading, writing, maths, music, whatever else you're doing, then you're taking away their joy in life. That's unkind. That's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And my job as a parent is not to break my children, but rather to grow them and mold them into who God wanted them to be. So I have a drawer. I need to encourage his drawing and show his drawings off and show him that he can do this better and allow him to master that better. Yes, he still needs to learn to read and to write. And because our family always does does music, he needs to still do music. But maybe I can be a little bit more lenient on some of the other things so that he can actually focus on that drawing and have joy in that drawing. Or a child who loves getting out and riding his bike, maybe I can help that child to make a better bike path in our property so that he can have a really cool place to learn tricks and to get some joy in his day rather than constantly being in trouble for not getting this done or that done. I need to give them success. Mm -hmm. Uh, Particularly kids with ADHD are constantly being growled at because they're not good at this. Or they're not, they haven't listened to the instructions. They're not sitting still. They're not doing the right thing here or the right thing there. We need to give them success. We need to be able to praise these kids and to show them that they are loved by God. I was just saying this to one of my kids today. All my children were made by God and God doesn't make junk. They are beautiful in God's eyes. And yes, they have a propensity to sin in particular areas that perhaps I don't have that issue. But my job is not to continually put them down, but rather to build them up and to give them the ability to see who they are in God's eyes, rather than just to see themselves as junk, because they most certainly are not. God doesn't make junk and God doesn't make mistakes. Mm. So they are beautiful in God's eyes. Mm. Yeah, I was homeschooled as well for the second half of my school life. And one of the things that I just appreciate most about my homeschooling is being just allowed to focus on whatever I wanted to focus on and follow whatever interest I had. And I so appreciate that. That was Mm. my favorite part. (laughs) Yeah, well, one of my kids the last week has found a book series that they're really interested in and has not put it down. If I want to get any work done for that child, I need to say, okay, I'll hold the book for you for half an hour. Now, can you do this for me? (laughs) But uh, you get to the point where you're telling your child not to read, but this is what I've I've worked so hard to do. So 90% of the time I don't say, well, you've got to do this instead. But uh, if I was to go out right now, I know I'd find that child reading, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted. And when I know the struggles that child has had to read, ah, what a joy. Yeah. (laughs) Give them time to do what they need to do. Yeah. Yes. I also have another question that I have been starting to think about a little bit is so many of the different programs and teaching aids and even the curriculums and stuff utilize a lot of technology, like watching videos or doing things on an iPad or some even, you know, incorporate video games and that kind of thing. What are your Mm. preferences or opinions when it comes to technology and homeschooling? Yeah, the research is quite clear. The research has been out for some time that screen time is not good for kids and needs to be managed. And I still find it baffling that our schools are going in the opposite direction of the research. And it's important for kids to be able to use computers, yes, and it's important for them to be able to have access to some of this technology, yes, but to be in school and using the technology hour by hour is not helpful. Mm. So I limit my children to about half an hour a day of Mm. on-screen time by themselves and they are usually using a computer program of some sort. At the moment, I think most of them are playing on Prodigy and enjoying a game-like experience with learning reading or math skills. And I do use Teacher Monsters Read with my younger kids as they're learning to read. But other than that, no, I don't find much technology in terms of actual screen time a great benefit. I do use Audible a lot. Mm. Audible is the best friend of dyslexics. Audible is the best friend of mothers (laughs) and busy people and 
if you don't have a subscription to Audible, I am not getting money for this. If you don't have a subscription to Audible, you should get one. And I love the fact that I can listen to books. At the moment, I'm listening to Timothy Keller's book on prayer, which is really interesting. And I can listen to it at 1.2 and get through the book really fast and then re-listen yep. to it. Or I can listen to it on slow and just listen to it at the speed that the guy reads it at. But it means that I'm able to get through a book whilst I'm going on my walk in the morning or whilst I'm hanging clothes on the line or doing dishes. And so being able to use that sort of technology is really helpful. Mm. I have one child who is listening to books almost all the time and she does that by listening to books on an iPhone. Yes, it's technically a phone, but she just has it plugged into her ears and she just loves listening to the books. That's what I was going to ask. How do they listen to Audible? Is it um, through your phone or through an iPad or a computer? I call it an iPhone, but it and it is an iPhone, but it's not connected to the internet other than yeah. in our home. Yeah. So iPhone, really, it's an iPod. I suppose it's just an expensive iPod. <laughs> uh, and at night time, we put the kids to bed. I used to read to the kids, read aloud to the kids, but as time has gone by, I've become more and more exhausted at the end of the night, mm. the end of the evening, and so I just can't keep reading. And I'm older and I need glasses now, and so it just makes it that much harder to read. So I stopped reading aloud to the kids at night except for when we're on holidays. And so they listen to an audible book. Yep. So I've got kids listening to Wind in the Willows and Anne of Green Gables. What else are we listening to? The Ark, the Reed and the Fire Cloud. And really, there's some really good old books on there like Black Beauty. And a lot of them, if you have a subscription, you can get them for free off Audible because they have a large section of free books that you can just download. And Often they're the old books and they're the ones that you want because you don't want the modern books. A lot of modern books sadly have gone the way of modern TV, which if you've looked at modern TV in the last five, ten years, it's, it's not getting better. People ask why mm. I have so many kids. I'm telling you, TV is not getting any good, any better. So, you, you know. Yeah. Love that idea of using a separate phone because my daughter loves to listen to things as well. And I did ask you about that a couple of days ago and you said play her audible and so I thought that's a great idea but I don't want her to be connected to my phone all day because I use that <laughs> but I do have an old phone that I could use for that so that's a really great tip actually and that's what the old phones are for yeah totally take yes, out great. take out that sim card you don't need the sim card mm -hmm. in there for a child no. and take off all the unnecessary programs on there. Make sure you've got a lock on it. And yep. if you've got an Apple phone, you have the ability to lock the child on a particular app for a limited time. That's a godsend. It means that the app itself tells the child that they're no longer playing and they get sick of it and they go, oh, okay, well, I'm not playing the app anymore. And they off they go. <laughs> we need to use these tools as a tool. Yeah. And for children to be able to listen to a story, it's absolutely beautiful. And they read well. And children listening to audiobooks are listening to good syntax, good grammar, spoken beautifully. They are learning as they listen. And particularly if we're listening to those old books, the older books have good values in them most of the time. The newer stuff can be a little bit dodgy. Uh, so you need to use some common sense, either common sense media or uh, what is it, plugged in, I think have yep. often have reviews of books and so you need to look at some of those reviews before you pick just any old book for your kid to listen to if you're not going to listen to it first that's only if it's modern books I'm talking in the last 15 years or so yeah and that's yeah. the thing with reading reading hugely helps with writing as well doesn't it yeah well that's the way that I learned how to write by looking at how books are written if you want to learn how to do good art you look at the best artists. If you want to learn how to be a pianist, you don't just go and play on the piano by yourself. You learn Bach or you learn Mozart. Yeah. So you're not making up your own music first off. You learn from the greats. You want to learn how to write, you start copying the style of the great. Start copying the style of C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. It's the mm -hmm. best way to learn to be a better writer. Yes, and I think that's actually one of the core tenets of classical education is actually going straight to the experts and just learning from them and copying them, listening to them and reading them. 
Exactly. So yeah. it, in terms of teaching my children to write, I use the IEW writing program and that has described for me how I already write. So I already was doing that, except I didn't know how to tell the children how to do it. So it breaks it down into a very simple process and then it's simple plus one. You just add one more bit to upgrade your writing. Just, okay, now you've got it to this section. Now let's just add one more so that it's breaking it down very simply how to teach my children to write. So that covers the writing process for the kids and that's been really helpful for the kids with dyslexia and dysgraphia Hmm. yeah so what actually is dysgraphia dysgraphia is a neurological disorder that is a writing difficulty a writing disability essentially it means that the child or the person's writing is distorted or incorrect in different ways that they're producing their writing okay so dyslexia is more for reading would you say Yes, dyslexia is reading and often children with dyslexia will say that they see the words moving on the page and it involves difficulty reading due to problems identifying the speech sounds and how they relate to the letters and the words, so the decoding of the writing. Oftentimes they'll see the words actually moving on the page. Okay. And so you're going to ask about dyscalculia as well. Okay, so what's that one then? (laughs) That's for maths. So you can hit the calculator in it and obviously the dis means something's not going quite right. It's having difficulty with mathematical concepts and learning those mathematical concepts. Yeah. And oftentimes children with dyslexia, if you have moderate to severe dyslexia, they may be people that cannot learn to read. Okay. So I have one child who really only learnt to read by themselves, pick up a book, kind of can read. Age 13, another child, mm, still struggling, uh, 14. So these are difficulties that take a long time to manage. And with all these learning difficulties, it's understanding that it's just step by step. We're not trying to get to reading yesterday. Yeah, It's every little five minutes counts. And Charlotte Mason is quite keen on short lessons for children and just slowly getting those lessons bigger and bigger but for children with dyslexia dysgraphia dyscalculia for children with adhd or asd having those lessons short is absolutely vital and allows them to have that success in that small amount of time even if it's really the same thing that they learned yesterday because often, often children with adhd will have poor working memory and that means that it's just the working memory is the bit you use to retrieve information. So if you are adding 35 plus 16, I know some people can do that in their head just like that. I mm-hmm. can't. Uh, but it's holding that information. Okay, well, it's 35 and 16, and I've got to hold the three and the one there whilst I do the five and the six. And doing that for somebody with poor working memory, which is often the case with ADHD, that's really, really hard. That's like yes. asking them to push a big boulder up a hill. It's very, very difficult. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So how do you keep your children encouraged? Because as the mother, you're educating your children and they have different struggles here and there. And I understand that you have um, accommodated their differences and their difficulties by using Charlotte Mason and different things. Do they still have moments where their ADHD or their dyslexia, it does create this burden for them? And how do you encourage them through that? Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard work. And it's a daily and hour by hour, moment by moment process of sitting with my children and encouraging them to keep going. There are tears almost every day, either from yep. them or from me, and it's hard work keeping them encouraged. I suppose early on as I was having babies and in that early baby time, both of you are in, I know how busy that is. I would have a baby year. Uh, that's a year where I had the baby and I knew that having a baby was going back to square one and I would have to start building up my energy from scratch every time. Yeah. I was very sick with my pregnancies and very sick with the baby directly afterwards and just a lot of hard work because that's what my journey mm-hmm. entailed. And I started doing school as 
the basics. And I think I started doing that back even when Enoch was little, when he was doing kindergarten year one. And so for me, the basics in our family are reading, writing and arithmetic. So the three R's Mm -hmm. and music. And that's a basic school. And for you, basic school might be different. And for each family, basic school might be different. But for me, reading, writing, arithmetic and maths and music rather. The music is there because that's part of brain development. Research that's out there, an Australian lady, Anita Collins, looked into which came first. Was it the, all the doctors who are intelligent who can play music or was it the fact that they can play music that made them intelligent so they became doctors? <laughs> so which came, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And she's looked into that and discovered that actually it's the music that yes. develops their brain and got some very brave mothers who would allow their children to have their brains scanned two weeks old, or is it two days? I'm not 100% sure of that particular study, but she allowed her babies to have their brains scanned. And right at the beginning, when a baby hears its mother's voice, all the music centers of the brain light up. And that to me is heartwarming stuff. Yes. So when your baby hears your voice, it hears music, particularly mama's voice. <laughs> what a delight. And it's gorgeous. And if you are an eight-year-old and you've learnt to read music, then your brain is actually 30% bigger than another eight-year-old who hasn't learnt to read music. So um, here I have all these learning difficulties and neurodiversity, other issues and the best thing that I can do for those kids is teach them music. So we sing yeah. together. They play the piano. They play other musical instruments. This this is part of my vital plan of getting them the help that they need. And so my basic subjects then, music, math, reading, writing, that's basic school. And if I get mm-hmm. history done in a day, wow, I've had a good day. Yep. If we go for a bike ride or if we get some gardening done, that's a good day. So I don't panic about other subjects. And yeah, that's true. I have friends who do Latin and Greek with their kids. And part of me is jealous because I'd love to be able to read the Bible in Greek. That'd be grand. I'd love to be able to see the world in a different way than I do from that perspective. But this is what I can manage. And if I have to do basic school for the rest of the time, then I'm still doing a great job. Mm -hmm. School doesn't need to be ensuring that my kids have done their spelling list and giving my kids a long list of to-dos that they can't do. So part of encouraging my kids has been breaking school down to the basics. To get these four things done, go play, have fun, go be kids outside, go ride your bike, go play in the playground at the back, go play with the goats, enjoy the day. And I think that's how education is meant to be. We're not meant to be stuck filling out a list and making sure we've ticked off the list. And have you done everything? Mm -hmm. Uh, When it comes to the end, my kids won't have done everything they could have done. There's always going to be a bit they missed here or a bit they missed there. But I've got my eldest into uni. Yay. So, and my next one is in uni. Yay. So I've graduated two out of seven. That's not bad. It's a good start. And I think the most important thing in their education has been God's word and Mm. making sure that they have that as their centerpiece, as their cornerstone. Yes. Mm. And the Bible is the greatest living book. There is absolutely one of Charlotte Mason's terms. Absolutely. And alongside that, as Lutherans, we can use the catechism as a part of our school. So I notice in the Lutheran schools I've been to that the catechism isn't seen much. Yeah. But in our little Lutheran school, in my home, we use the catechism and I have discovered the catechism is this massive tool it's fantastic it's got all these answers and questions that work and if you get the expanded with the explanation wow what a blessing you can have whole conversations on that and it's about having books with conversation it's not just i go away and listen to a book but actually talking about the book, who was the person? Well, like Luther said courage? at the start of the catechism, you shouldn't let your children eat until they know it. <laughs> Absolutely. 
So how has God sustained you while your hands are full and your workload is heavy? My workload is heavy, yeah. Um, (laughs) My mama has been a massive blessing to our family. She's amazing. She's a fantastic professional who works with behaviour issues all the time. So I have my own personal behaviour specialist which yeah. has just been a massive blessing. And they've also been in ministry for over 50 years. So with the difficulties that come in ministry, Christian and I have been able to talk to mum and dad about those issues, been able to talk to my mum about the issues that I have with the kids. She gives me advice. She gives me patience and wisdom, and helps me to keep on keeping on. And she gives me encouragement. But also my mama. She loves to sing and she was the one who gave music to my family in the sense that as a kid, she insisted we learn piano. And Mm -hmm. I remember six o'clock, my turn was to go on the piano at 6 a.m. in the morning and I would play the piano and play those silly scales, (laughs) which, you know, now I think, oh, actually that was a blessing. But at the time I remember thinking, I don't like scales. (laughs) But I am so grateful to my mama for insisting that we learn the piano. And my mama also sings and she loves to sing. She still sings a lot. She's one of those rare, gorgeous people that if you say the right word or a line in a song hits in her head, she'll sing the entire verse or the song. And uh, yeah, that's a really good way to change the tone when you're distressed. And for me, to help me work through my distress. So for me, music affects my entire body and certain songs make me cry every time or other certain songs will give me joy that's just indescribable. So, if, you know, if I need to have a good cry, I can listen to certain songs and just helps me. It's very cathartic. It helps to get rid of that. But I also have taught my own family to sing and we sing together a lot and enjoy that. Bible memory has helped a lot. So That Simply Charlotte Mason way of doing Bible memory has been important for me to be able to have my own Bible time. So Mm -hmm. it's very hard when you're the only one, when I'm always with the kids. Uh, It's very hard to find personal time, uh, as as you know. Yeah. But doing Bible memory with the kids and making that a part of who I am as well as them, the Holy Spirit takes that Bible verse and brings it back to me later on. And I can then dwell on that while I'm doing life, while I'm doing whatever I need to be doing. And that's been such a delight. And also I have a very dear friend who I love, who calls me every few weeks or so. And I love her phone calls. Uh, She, I'll drop everything for her and uh, I'll make a cup of tea and we chat. And yeah. that's usually for at least an hour. The kids know if she rings, I'm gone. <laughs> they can just yeah. go away. And if she rings in the morning during school time, school is over. Whoops. Oh, yeah. well. Uh, uh, and very rarely do I put her off. Like I think I've only once or twice said, I can't talk right now. I've got to go. I'm, I'm running out the, out the door right now. Call me later. But she is such a huge encouragement to me. And I love her phone calls. I admit that she calls me more than I call her, but I love that about her. I love that she's willing to give me the call. And that has been super, super encouraging. Also, she's just recently encouraged me to start a sharing, a study sharing type group. And so uh, there are four of us pastor's wives who get together and Mm -hmm. on Zoom every other week. And we're currently reading through screw tape letters together. And that's a huge blessing. Those women are yes. lovely and I am so grateful to God for their support and for just the ability to have that time together. That's us. And we can share our lives together, share the difficulties that we're having, pray together. I, I crave that and I need that. And I'm so grateful to yes. my dear friend for pushing me to do that. <laughs> yeah. So music, yep. Bible and friends. Yeah. And mum. Very much so. And mum. And mum. Yes. Don't uh, forget your mama. Oh, and I should add to that, my dear daughter, Abigail, she's she's such a blessing. She sees when I'm having a hard time. She'll say, do you need a cup of tea now, mom? And we'll go for a walk together, just the two of us. And yeah, she'll give me a hug when she can see things are tough and just keeps telling me, it's okay, mum, you're doing a great job. And yeah, Christian does that too, but he's only around at the end of the day. So he's not it around. Sounds like he's very day. busy, yeah. He's very busy. Yes. Well, Sarah Joy, thank you so much for 
really opening your heart and sharing your joys and struggles with us today. It's been so beautiful to have you on and thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to share before I go, there's also podcasts to listen to that people should be listening to that are really helpful. Yep. I think Issues Etc. has been really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. White Horse Inn, Undeception, Mm -hmm. the Word of the Lord podcast. Never give up uh, listening to God's Word, but also to other people expounding on God's Word. It's very good. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. You have been listening to the Here She Stands podcast. Join us again in two weeks' time when we talk with Tatiana Overdune from Adelaide. Tatiana is a school teacher with a passion for writing, music, and theology. She will be sharing her testimony and talking about how, as Christians, our true identity is found in the identity of someone else, Jesus Christ. Don't forget to check out the show notes for information and links relating to today's episode. You can find Here She Stands on Facebook and Instagram, or you can email us at hereshestands.podcast at gmail.com. If you would like to sign up to our newsletter, download our episode transcripts, or find out more about us, head on over to our website at hereshestands.online. Until then, we pray that you will hold fast to God's word and confidently say, Here I stand, I can do no other.